It's very hard to combat power by creating additional concentrations of power. Corporations are strong. Social institutions that might be oppressive are strong. You know who's stronger? A government is a government because they have a monopoly on the initiation of force over some geographic territory. And they have overwhelming coercive power on their side. And any solution to promoting liberty that basically comes by saying, let's strengthen the government and have them sort it out. American Politics 101 kind of tells you, well, okay, the natural next question is who will guard the guardians? That's at the heart of our constitutional tradition. And so there's a lot of old wisdom that's being lost. There may be well-meaning people who are trying to undo wrongs and right wrongs that they perceive in America's history, but ultimately they're empowering the entity that has more ability than any other organization that we deal with to oppress us. That's not a sustainable solution for human liberty. So what is a sustainable solution for human liberty, according to Alex Salter? <laughs> according, that's, again, big questions. I like this. The sustainable <laughs> solution to human liberty is to lower the stakes of politics. One of the reasons that things have gotten so inflamed lately is because we've vested, especially the national government, with so much authority that the stakes of who wins our daily, yearly, whatever political contests are so high. We're getting to the point now where the rhetoric is saying that pretty much every election is the most important election in the world. Now, I don't think that that's actually true, but there's a kernel of truth in it because the stakes of politics right now are higher than they have been in a very long time. What we have is a clash of worldviews where they're taking place in the political arena and what basically amounts to a winner takes all tournament. That's not a recipe for social peace. When the populace is constantly riled up, when people are constantly mad at each other, when people are constantly fearful, you're not going to get liberty and respect for human dignity. You're just going to alternate. You talked about the pendulum before. You're just going to alternate who has the reins of power and who's going to use it to beat home. That's absolutely not the way that we want to go if we're serious about liberty and dignity. There needs to be a collective embracing of not trying to solve our problems using politics. We need to actually get back to civil society, which once upon a time was actually a really important thing in the United States. Right? There was that old uh, quip from Tocqueville that the first thing that Amer if you get three Americans together in a room, the very first thing they do is elect a treasurer. This idea that, they, <laughs> that we're very civically spirited and we want to form voluntary organizations to solve all these problems. And once upon a time, that was great. They actually made real progress in providing services that now we think can only be provided by the government. We need to reacquire the spirit of self-governance that we had early on in the Republic and basically say, look, I know we have problems. I know that there are things that need to be solved, but getting Washington involved is going to make things worse and raise the stakes of politics besides. That's not good for anyone. Right? The president was elected based on his promise to, quote, lower the temperature, unquote, in politics, and he's done the exact opposite. So I think that the idea was good. We actually need to go out and do it. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I was speaking with Samuel Gregg about this and basically how you have the left that were typically looking at somebody to kind of manage them, bigger government, you know, more intervention. And then in the 80s, you had the right who were basically pro-free market. Uh, they were for less tariffs, less intervention, more liberty, smaller government. Uh, but he expresses in his uh, book, The Next American Economy, how this is changing now and that the political right have become economic nationalists, a lot of them. And people are arguing that you need more intervention. So it's like you're having these two budding heads, these two budding political heads, like the right and the left who are saying, well, I have all of the answers. Just give give me the power. Give me the wand. Give me, you know, that, that magic stick that I can just wave and uh, I'll fix it on my side. There is unfortunately a lot of that going on. And what you have people on the new right who are embracing strong government, what they're saying is basically, look, we've tried Reaganism, we've tried free market policies for 40 years. We haven't really done anything to dislodge the left from the halls of power and the bureaucracy and the executive agencies. All we've really done is weaken ourselves. So if we want a society that respects our values, our only choice now is to ante up and get back in the game. We've got to take over these agencies. We've got to fight fire using fire and basically wield the power of the state to advance small C conservative goals. 
there's a certain logic to that, but at the same time, you're basically saying you want to declare a political war of all against all. How do you think that that's going to go for you? How do you think that that's going to work when every single election is a referendum on the direction that Washington is going to come down on just perpetually for the next two to six years or whatever? There's going to be no civic peace there. There's going to be no civic friendship there. There's no going to be any way that we can get along. What we need to figure out is a way to actually agree to disagree, which means figuring out ways to get Washington to do less in general while also devolving power, decision-making authority to more local political units, the states, local communities, because that's going to give people the option to embrace local living conditions that they feel reflect their values, and then at least people can pick their communities based on those values. So that's sort of an intermediate solution based on federalism, which the old right, the 1980s right, was big on, but the new right is not very, uh, not very optimistic about. I mean, they're calling themselves national conservatives for a reason. Right, right. Um, so why do you think that is? I know that Sam has his own hypothesis, but why do you think that the political right has gone in that direction? The charitable answer is just what I mentioned before. They've basically seen the strategy that was embraced since the Reagan era as not having worked, and so they're trying something else. I do wonder sometimes whether there's more to it than that, whether people just are really amped up about seizing the reins of power and using them to advance this kind of society that they want. And yeah. I understand the temptation, but again, once you wear the ring of power, things never go the same again. This is so funny that you said that because I was literally just thinking about J.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings. And I was thinking about in the, in the first film, actually, that scene where I think it's Faramir, he takes the ring from Frodo, right? Because he wants to be able to use it to rule and you know he he you see that the power corrupts him uh, right away and he kind of becomes a little bit evil you know of course it's done in a sensational way to to show you uh mm. right in your face what that could look like but that's exactly what i was thinking of so i guess the issue is how do we how do we promote these ideas to people to show them that you can't have this this uh one mass of, of power that will rule everything uh, in a way that will be benevolent, that it will always turn for the worse? Like, what can we do to, to show people that they can have faith in, in basically ruling themselves? I think the thing to do is just keep on making the point about basic American political theory, public choice economics. We have the tools in our toolkit, right? If you go back and read the founding documents, if you go back and read the Federalist Papers, Heck, if you go back and read the Anti-Federalist Papers, there's a lot of stuff in our founding tradition that's making these exact same arguments. And a lot of those predictions have almost eerily come true. So we need to realize that this is not something foreign to the American political tradition that we're talking about. This is the American political tradition itself. We've been outside the operating envelope for decades now. What we need to do is actually pick up the user's manual and figure out how we get back to regular order. And I think that it's going to be persuasive to people if we can make the argument like this is not something radical and untried. This is the way that things used to work for the most part. We have a precedent in American history and we can do that. Right? We can actually do that. A lot of people might think it's counterproductive that we actually have to bind Washington's hands to actually make sure that we get more liberty for everybody. But if you look at what Washington's been doing for the past 10, 20, 30 years, maybe that's not so strange because it's not been great. Rights yeah. violations here, trampling on liberty there. A lot of the new stuff that Uncle Sam does is frankly harmful to individual liberty as well as the common good. So I think that we need to get for humanistic civic purposes an agenda behind the idea that we're going to simply solve fewer of our problems using politics. And that's ultimately yeah. what the rule of law is about, to try and take those politically exploitative options off the table. Make it less important who actually wins the election. 